رسول الله حبيب الله الله our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he only humans to be the best and give his best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he only humans to be the best Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to another live edition of Gardens of the Pious. Today's episode is number 615 and it will be the third in chapter number 264. Babu tahrimi la'ani insanin bi'aynihi aw dabba the prohibition of cursing a particular person or cattle and uh, all of that is under the chapter of al umur al manhi anha the book of the prohibited actions um, today's episode inshallah is also going to be the last episode of gardens of the pious before the blessed month of ramadan and as you know that every ramadan we pause all programs with the exception of uh, Askoda, which will be aired mashallah uh, on daily basis during the blessed month of ramadan same time except on fridays we we'll give you a day off and we we'll also take a day off also there will be a night Askoda for a convenient broadcast time for the viewers in north america inshallah which will be approximately fajr time our time here during Ramadan by the grace of Allah we have new pre-recorded programs which will be also aired on daily basis by the grace of Allah to replace gardens of the pious and correct your citation this Ramadan mashallah Sheikh Ibrahim Zidane finished filming the seventh series of um, Quranic circle and it's a beautiful one this uh, season is about faith in the ayat of the Quran with a group of uh, great reciters of the Quran mashallah and his commentary uh, on that so may Allah the Almighty make this Ramadan a blessed and a happy Ramadan and very beneficial uh, here at Huda TV myself on behalf of the crew the cast and every person who's working in Huda TV would like to extend our uh, greetings and congratulations with the blessed month of Ramadan which inshallah should begin in a couple hours in a couple hours the moon citation of the first night of the month of Ramadan inshallah azzajal we wish you all a happy and blessed Ramadan without any further ado I begin by praising the Almighty Allah alone and sending the greatest peace and salutations upon his most beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam with hadith number 1556 before I tackle the hadith I want to bring to your attention that awfully people uh, when they get upset they curse sometimes when you start your car and the engine doesn't kick off so some people curse they curse the car they curse the engine they curse uh, they find a, a flat tire they curse the tires this is a grave mistake because cursing whether to a living being a human being or an animal or to a lifeless object let it be a car a vehicle an engine a bike um, a desk anything the curse means to be expelled from allah's mercy and if anything is deprived from allah's mercy then it is the most unfortunate thing so that's why we will find in the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ would not accompany anything even if it is a cattle that has been cursed, even if it was done without right. As a means of punishing the person who said, may God curse you to a human, to a specific cattle or to a thing. So may Allah guide us to what is best. We need to train our tongues to say what is good or the least to refrain ourselves from saying anything and this is actually in a sound hadith 
Let whoever believe in Allah and the last day to say what is good or to be quiet. So in hadith number 1556, which is collected by Abu Dawood, may Allah have mercy on him. And it is narrated by Abu Darda, may Allah be pleased with him. He said, قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إن العبد إذا لعن شيئا صعدت اللعنة إلى السماء فتغلق أبواب السماء دونها ثم تهبط إلى الأرض فتغلق أبوابها دونها ثم تأخذ يمينا وشمالا فإذا لم تجد مساغا رجعت إلى الذي لعن فإن كان أهلا لذلك in this great hadith, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Whenever a person curses somebody or even something, not necessarily a human being, then that curse goes up to heaven. Because when you say, may God curse you, the Almighty Allah said that he is above the throne. So the supplication ascends to him, good or bad. But, not every supplication would reach him. There will be filters to filter out the awful invocations and the invocations of curse and that which make no sense. So whenever a person curses somebody or something, the curse goes up to heaven and the gates of heaven get closed. Then it comes down to the earth and its gates get closed. Then it turns right and it turns left and then if it doesn't find any way out, any entrance uh, or anywhere to go to, then it returns to the person or thing that had been cursed. And if he or she or it or they deserve to be cursed, then they will be cursed. Otherwise, it returns to the person who uttered it. So this is my dear viewers, a serious warning from the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him. So when the word comes out of your mouth with a supplication, with an invocation, we know we studied in the book of Ad-Dua. مَا لَمْ يَدْعُوا بِإِثْمٍ أَوْ قَطِيعَةِ رَحْمٍ Not every dua will be accepted. Sometimes a person makes an awful dua which tends or aims at severing the ties of kinship. Or a dua which is evil. We get some messages. Well, the woman whom I always loved, she got married. Can I still make dua that may Allah make me marry her? That is idiot. She's already married. You got to honor that. You got to respect that. Do you know that when a woman is already divorced and she is in the idda of three quru, three menses or three months, you're not even allowed to hint to her that you're interested in marrying her. And obviously she and her guardian and her family are not allowed to accept any proposals or talk about marriage. Why not? Because even though she's divorced, she is officially still with somebody else. And he can take her back to his marriage life and revoke the divorce without her consent. Without a need for an agreement from her guardian. Okay? فَإِمْسَاكُمْ بِمَعْرُوفٍ أَوْ تَسْرِيحٌ بِإِحْسَانٍ Not until and unless the, the idda elapsed, then... It's not possible to propose or to show interest in a woman. Let alone asking Allah, Oh Allah, I love this woman and I want to marry her. She's married. Don't you get it? So this is a dua of a sin. Somebody cut you off while driving. You're very offended. You're very upset. So you start cursing him, asking Allah, may you get killed. May you die in a car accident. Take it easy, my friend. All of that because somebody cut you off. Wallahi, if both of you happen to meet and you know that he was on a hurry, he was rushing because of an emergency, you would give him an excuse and the benefit of doubt. Then how would you swallow and take back curse in him or her? 
invoking Allah that they may get killed in a car accident. So take it easy. Be merciful. Man la yarham, la yurham. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said, when it comes to the curse, and the curse means la'anakallah, may Allah curse you, or may Allah's wrath be upon you, al-ghadab. And that is mentioned in the Quran. Okay? وَمَنْ يَقْتُ الْمُؤْمِنَ مُتَعَمِّدًا فَجَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّمُ خَالِدًا فِيهَا وَغَضِبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَلَعَنَهُ وَغَضِبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَلَعَنَهُ This is general curse. And whoever meets the description, then he's accursed. Okay? Here, if a person invokes Allah to curse another specific person, his curse ascends because this is dua, is ascending. But the doors of the first heaven, the world heaven, are locked tight. And that dua will not go through it. Why not? Because it's a curse. So what am I supposed to go? Go back to earth. And the curse goes back to earth and it starts searching right, left, down, in any direction, no gate will be opened for it. So it will go directly to the person or thing which has been cursed. If he or she or it deserve the curse, then they will get hit with the curse. If not, then it would only affect the person who have made the curse. Who wants to take that risk? How do you know that, that this person whom you said, may Allah curse you, actually deserves the curse? Maybe that is only in your views, in your assumption, in your false judgment. And the risk is similar too. Whenever a Muslim says to another Muslim, Ya Kafir, oh who you disbelieve, you're a disbeliever. Then that word is a label and a title for one of them. So if the person whom you said you are a kafir to him or to her isn't a kafir, then you are the kafir one. You want to take that chance? You want to take that risk? No. So what would you do? There is a general dua in his state which is to say, Ala la'natullahi ala zalimin. Indeed, Allah's curse is upon the wrongdoers. That's in the Quran. If he or she, if they are among the wrongdoers who deserve the curse, it will affect them. But to curse a specific person, it's very risky. Don't do that, please. It's similar to judging the fate of a specific person which we have no clue, we have no idea about. When a woman heard that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, saying, may Allah curse the one who plucks the eyebrows and the one who wears the wig, connects her hair, and the one who have tattoo, whether she have it for herself or does it for others, etc. Because they changed the creation of Allah. So this woman came rushing to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and said, Who gave you an access to curse people? He said, Why shouldn't I curse whomever Allah and his messenger have cursed? She said, You're saying Allah have cursed a woman who wears tattoo? And by the way, it's not only a woman, a, a woman or a man. And wearing a wig is a major sin. And uh, plucking the eyebrows is a major sin. And this is for both men and women. But why did he say namisa or washima for feminine? Because it happened mostly among women. But if a man does it, the same hukma applies. So wearing tattoos is forbidden for a male or a female in Islam. He said, yes, that's in the Quran. She said, I read the Quran from cover to cover. I never came across an ayah that curses a woman who wears tattoo or plucks the eyebrows. He said, have you read it? You should have found it. It's there in Surah Al-Hashr in which Allah the Almighty says, وَمَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ so Allah says anything the Messenger of Allah gives you, you should take it. Yani any command, He orders you with it, then you should act upon it. And if He forbids you against anything, then you should abstain from it. 
That is the meaning of ما أتاكم الرسول فخذوه وما نهاكم عنه فانتهوا So not necessarily everything that Allah, uh, Prophet Muhammad has forbidden, you will find it in the Quran because Allah gave him this access. So I have heard the messenger of Allah is saying so and so and so. Now, when I see a woman who's doing the plucking of the eyebrows, when I see a man who's wearing a tattoo, am I allowed to say, may Allah curse you? No. Why not? Because even though this person is indulged into a major sin, would she deserve the cursing? But Allah knows the condition of this person and whether he repented or not, and whether he would further repent in the future or not, and whether he is better before Allah than me or not. I'll give you an example without mentioning names. Every year when we go for Hajj and I teach my fellow American Muslims from North America, Canada, and the USA about the rights of Hajj. We have some Muslims, some reverts who just accepted Islam a few months ago, and they ask, so Sheikh, I'm wearing tattoo. I have been to have it for years. If I go for Hajj, would it be accepted? Is it valid? And one of them, He's a world-class singer. No need to mention names. And when he asked me, he said, it's not feasible to remove it now. Nowadays, there are, you know, the laser removal, it's painful, but it's achievable. We're talking about whenever it wasn't feasible. I said, no, it will not affect your hajj. Somebody who's wearing tattoo before uh, accepting Islam. Somebody who got tattoo before knowing that it is haram. How am I supposed to curse that person? Ah, oh, it's in the hadith. But you're not the one who should curse. So it will be sufficient to say, Ala la'natullahi ala zalimin. And when I see a Muslim actually indulged into a major sin, I would rather pray for his guidance, for his hidayah, than asking Allah to curse him. Why? We know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said in this respect, لا تكن عونا للشيطان على أخيك. One who will be pleased most when you curse another Muslim, even if he's a major sinner, none other than the shaitan. Because that curse assists the shaitan in achieving his purpose of taking that person out of heaven, depriving him out of Allah's mercy. I hope you brothers and sisters who are listening to me right now, uh, you perfectly understand and you perceive this message that is delivered in this beautiful hadith. The following hadith is hadith number 1557. An Imran ibn al-Husayn radiyallahu anhuma qal Baynama Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi ba'di asfarihi wa amra'atun min al-ansari ala naqatin fadajirat fala'anatha fasami'a thalika Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam فقال خذوا ما عليها ودعوها فإنها ملعونة قال عمران أي ابن الحسين فكأني أراها الآن تمشي في الناس ما يعرض لها أحد This hadith is a sound hadith and it is collected by Imam Muslim in his sound collection May Allah have mercy on him So the narrator says while the messenger of Allah peace be upon him was on a journey there was a woman from among the Ansar and she was riding on the back of her camel, she camel actually. So she abused and invoked curse upon the she camel. She said, She's saying that to the camel. Why? Because she was low. So the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, heard it and said, Offload it. Offload the she camel and set it free because it has been cursed. The narrator, Imran ibn Hussain said, I will, or I still perceive that she camel walking among people and none pays attention to it. Allow me to take the following hadith as well because it is in the same line and perhaps the same incident. Hadith number 1558, then I will explain them both uh, all together. An Abi Barzata Nadlata ibn Ubaid al-Aslami 
ابن عبيد الأسلمي رضي الله عنه قال بينما جارية على ناقة عليها بعض متاع القوم إذ بصرت بالنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وتضايق بهم الجبل فقالت حل اللهم عنها فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لا تصاحبنا ناقة عليها لعنة رواه مسلم What does it mean? The narrator who is Abu Barza Nadla ibn Ubaidin al-Aslami May Allah be pleased with him said While a young woman was riding a she camel on which there was the luggage of people suddenly she saw the messenger of Allah peace be upon him and the pass of the mountain became narrow for her people because of fear. So the young woman said to the she camel, go ahead. And when it didn't move, she said, oh Allah, curse that she camel. So the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, she camel that has been cursed should not accompany us. The two ahadith have been collected by Imam Muslim. They are both sound ahadith and they both indicate one thing. They indicate that as the story in both ahadith tell us that the Prophet was on a journey and uh, people were riding among the riders, a woman from Al-Ansar and by the way the word Jariyah. Some people right away will translate Jariyah as a slave woman. No. My daughter is called Jariyah. And one of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ was called Juwayriya, the minimization of Jariya. And Jariya means a young girl, a teenager. Okay, and a Juwayriya is even a minimization of that, a little girl. So this young girl was on riding on the back of the camel and he, she was kind of slow. And she has caused uh, a jam, a traffic jam when they were passing in a pass between the mountains. The young girl saw the Prophet ﷺ, everybody was panicking and that caused fear. So this woman from Al-Ansar or according to the hadith of uh, Abu Barza, may Allah be pleased with him, the Jariya, she cursed the she camel by saying Allahumma al-anha. You see in Islam, we don't only respect the humans, fellow humans, Muslims and non-Muslims only, but also we respect cattle, we respect animals. Not because it's a pet or because we, it's a domestic uh, uh, animal and we use it as a pet. Any animal, we don't curse. We don't curse. So when that woman said to the she camel, Allah, may Allah curse you, the Prophet ﷺ heard that. He said, offload the camel. Remove all the luggage and the saddle and let it go. Why, O oh Prophet of Allah? A she camel is like, you know, you have a land cruiser in the desert. We need it. Yeah, but an animal which has been cursed should not accompany us. Anything which has been cursed should not accompany us. Here when people read that, they would think this is a punishment for the she camel. No, it's not a punishment for the she camel. It's a punishment for the owner of the ride, of the she camel. You've cursed the camel which was bearing and carrying your loads, your luggage. Now go ahead and carry the luggage. But she's not going to accompany us. And this is a lesson for all the companions of the Prophet wasallam, and for all of us. Stop cursing. How would you like to drive a vehicle which had been cursed deprived from Allah's mercy and you're the driver. God forbid if anything wrong goes with it, it will affect you. And this is literally because people do not realize that I'm cursing my ride, I'm cursing my child, I'm cursing my house. Do not curse, lest the curse affect whatever you're benefiting out of that. So we said in the first hadith, uh, Umran bin Hussain said, I still see the she camel wandering around and no one would look at her. No one would claim it. So what is the fiqh verdict in this respect? 
What would a person do with a camel? Just let it go? Waste it? No. The person can take it. It can be sacrificed and its meat it can be eaten. It can be sold in the market and everything. But the Prophet ﷺ deprived the woman who have cursed the she-camel from benefiting out of it during this time. And he said, an animal which has been cursed should not accompany us. This is a punishment for the woman. But they still can benefit out of it later on. Brothers and sisters, that was the last hadith in the chapter 264. And now it's time to take a short break. We'll be back in a couple minutes. Please stay tuned. Dear viewers, if your age is up to 12, if you have a beautiful voice in reciting the Quran, if you got to know the correct pronunciation of the Quran, i.e. Tajweed, then you've got a chance to participate in Heavenly Voices. Just send us a well-lit, high-quality video of 3-5 to five minutes reciting the Quran at voices at huda dot tv voices at huda dot tv be one of the 30 heavenly voices that will be broadcasted on Huda TV daily this Ramadan. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Dear brothers and sisters All you who believe This is a special call From Allah the Almighty in the Quran Only for the believers In some verses in the Quran Allah says Ya ayyuhal nas Addressing all the humanity These are general messages To all the humanity But when Allah says Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu All you who believe He will have special messages Only for the believers all You Who Believe is a new series on Huda TV with Muhammad Masluh. I will be honored to host you. In every single episode, we will try to analyze and understand together how to implement one of those messages, especially for the believers, in every single ayah that starts with Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. Please stay tuned. It's by the mercy and the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we have Quran in circle for the seventh year. 
Quran Circle 7 will talk about Iman, faith, the belief, and the believers. What does it mean? What parts of Al Iman, what parts of belief? What constitutes a believer? What are the characteristics of the believers? And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepared for them in the hereafter? All of that by listening to beautiful recitations of the Quran. In these blessed nights, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from all of us and to make us all among the people of the Quran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Uh, let me share with you and remind you quickly our phone numbers and contact informations beginning with the area code 002 then 023855131. There is an alternative number, same area code, then 01005469323 and the WhatsApp numbers, area code 001-347-806-0025. And finally, area code 001-361-489-1503. Before I take any call, I would like to share with you some very good news, mashallah. A few days ago when we announced that we're launching a campaign in affiliation with Human Appeal out of the UK, to feed 1,000 families during the blessed month of Ramadan. The good news is, Alhamdulillah wa shukrullah, we were able to provide food for 300 families. More than 126,000 meals have been distributed already by the grace of Allah. Alhamdulillah. So, 300 families have enough food for iftar and suhoor meals throughout the whole blessed month of Ramadan. I want to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the first place for giving us the insight and tendering our hearts to make us feel the need of those who are in need. Secondly, I thank you my dear respected viewers for helping and assisting. Thirdly, I want to thank human appeal for uh, taking the load of our shoulders and delivering the food provision to those who are in need. May the Almighty Allah bless you all. In the sound hadith, the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, Whenever you give food to a fasting person or persons to break their fast upon, whether in Ramadan or any day that they are fasting during, that they will receive a full reward for their fasting, and you, the provider of that provision, would receive a similar reward, the same exact reward of fasting, of that fasting person, without diminishing the reward of either one of you. Alhamdulillah. And that's why every Ramadan I say, who would like to fast Ramadan this year? 60 days instead of 30, 90 days instead of 30, or 120 days, or even as many number of Ramadan multiplied by any factor as you wish. Each day of Ramadan, when you feed one person, if you do that throughout the month of Ramadan, Alhamdulillah, you secure the reward of fasting two Ramadans in one. And you happen to feed two people every day in Ramadan, you have secured the reward of fasting for three Ramadans, one for yourself and two on behalf of the people whom you offered iftar at the time of breaking their fast. When we fast and we taste a little bit of hunger, a little bit of thirst, and we refrain ourselves from the food that we desire and we like. And then we know that it's only a matter of a few hours. And at the iftar table, I would have my delicious spicy biryani. Or I would have my Arabic food or hanif or whatever, mashallah, or the seafood you like. So that gives you 
a great deal of patience. يعني in a little bit I will get to eat. In a little bit I will get to drink. But Allah, you have been to some countries. There is no drinking water. There is no drinking water. And the people, you know, they have to walk on foot for miles to fetch a bucket of water or a few gallons of water. They carry them over their heads. And they are, number one, our brothers in humanity. And number two, they are Muslims like us. And we, as Muslims, the Prophet ﷺ described us as كَمَثَلِ الْجَسَدِ الْوَاحِدِ A single body. If you're having a problem, if you're having a little bit of migraine, migraine, it drives you crazy. The whole body is aching. Why? Because it's me. It's in my body. A true Muslim would feel the pain of those who are in the refugee camps uh, in Bangladesh because they are being you know, exiled or kicked out of their homes in Burma, Myanmar, or in Kashmir, or on the borders of Pakistan, or in Iraq. It used to be a very uh, prosperous country. But Qaddar Allah ma sha'afa'ad. Uh, Syria, the borders between Syria and Turkey, a couple million refugees here and there. So when I eat the meal and I say, Alhamdulillah, my kids, Alhamdulillah, we made sure that, MashaAllah, we have some families who are eating today with us. We're eating iftar like us. That will be the most delicious food I eat because I eat while knowing that I have become and I happen to be a means or a cause to feed other families, other Muslims who are in need. I'm not a fundraiser. I'm not, and I don't like to be a fundraiser. But I think it is my duty before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if I have that screen, if I have that window, and I have seen it since last Ramadan, mashallah, we were able by the grace of Allah and through the help of human appeal to deliver food to tens of thousands of people. So why not? So. I'm doing the viewers a favor to share with them. Those guys are authentic. And alhamdulillah wa shukrillah, in any country when you swap your card or you donate, you can deduct it from your tax. Whether you live in North America, USA and Canada, or all over Europe, or in the countries where you can deduct it, it's tax deductible. And you happen to feed and uh, provide provision for those who are in need. Make this Ramadan your best Ramadan by providing for as many families as you can. Alhamdulillah, before Ramadan began, 300 families will secure their meals for the whole month of Ramadan. So my dear viewers, thank you so much. Jazakumullahu khairan. And now we'll be happy to continue, inshallah. Sister Amatullah from India. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Go ahead, Sister Amatullah. Um, Sheikh, my first question was that how to uh, repent after listening or doing uh, slandering or backbiting of a non-Muslim or some, someone who uh, I think may be a non-Muslim, I'm not sure. Sometimes like they are politicians or ministers, how can I ask them for forgiveness? And my second question is that... Um, um, uh, what uh, is the uh, ruling of Salatul Duha? What is the uh, ajar of uh, offering it and how to offer it? What is the best time to offer it and so on? All right. Thank you, Amatullah from India. Brother Suleiman from Spain. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum Shalom Sheikh. I have two questions. The first one is uh, in, with impure clothes. Is it enough to put them in a washing machine and wash them? Because I fear maybe there is too much clothes in the washing machine and water may not reach all of them. And the second question is with there is an ice cream that has 0.008% of fermented alcohol. I asked the manufacturers and I have done the, cal the calculations and it amounts to one and a half drops in one liter of ice cream. Is it, is it, is it allowed to eat it? Thank I, you. I got your question, Suleiman. Salheen from Canada, Assalamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Assalam, Sheikh, uh, how are you today? Alhamdulillah, I'm doing fine, Salheen. Thank you for asking, and you? 
Uh, I'm good, alhamdulillah. Uh, Sheikh, my question is, uh, if someone breaks an oath uh, that they made by Allah mm -hmm. and they have to expiate by feeding 10 people, mm -hmm. uh, if it, uh, is it okay that if they feed uh, 10 uh, fasting, like they give iftar for 10 fasting people, would that cover it? Of course, it would. Yes, and this is even a greater word. Okay, Salheen. Thank you. Uh, Muhammad from India. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Go ahead, Muhammad. Yes, yes, Sheikh. How are you, Sheikh? Alhamdulillah, Akhi. Thank you. And you? I'm fine, Sheikh. Sheikh, I'm a big fan of you, Sheikh. Like, I've known you for so many years and I'm a great fan of you and I love you so much, Sheikh. Thank you, Muhammad, and may the one whom you love me for his sake love you as well. Thank you so much for your trust. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm so glad to talk with you after a really long time. I also heard that uh, you were uh, infected by the COVID-19, and I hope, alhamdulillah, you're fine now. Alhamdulillah, I'm doing much better. Jazakallahu khairan, akhi Muhammad. And may Allah really? preserve the so whole happy. ummah. Yes, Sheikh, I'm so happy to hear this from you. After a long time, I'm talking with you and I'm very excited. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khairan. So today, do you have any questions, Muhammad? Yes, Sheikh. Uh, I just, uh, I'm 19 years old, Sheikh. Mashallah. And I want to seek the knowledge of Islam. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to start, where to start. So if you could just give me a guidance upon this, it would be better, Sheikh. Muhammad, while you are in India, Masha'Allah, the Islamic University of Medina have opened their courses online so it's like you know you travel to Medina and you stay in the campus and learn so mashallah you can actually apply and earn your degree while you are in India without traveling there is also a blessed university called KIU knowledge in a national university led by very prestigious scholars mashallah it's located in Riyadh KSA there is Mishka University, and uh, I highly admire it and recommend it. And it is located in Florida and in uh, Texas, and it's available online. Uh, undergrad, master's, PhD in Islamic studies. You can also take a few courses if you want to. Uh, Dr. Bilal Phillips University is offering courses and also uh, degrees. The distant learning is the ultimate solution for learning the deen nowadays. You don't have to travel anywhere. You don't have to obtain a visa and encounter the financial trouble. You can study at home by the grace of Allah. So I encourage all the viewers to check out any of the previous universities or academies that I listed. Go ahead and sign up and learn, acquire knowledge. إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ بِالتَّعَلُّمُ the more you learn, the more you will find yourself automatically signing up for more and more classes. Because in al ilm knowledge is light. And obviously, when you have the keys to the light and you turn one, it turns on. You turn the second and it's a brighter light. You keep turning the third and the fourth. Knowledge is like that. So I hope you've written the names of these universities. Uh, search them online. Sign up and start learning. May Allah bless you and your family. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Latifa from the USA. Welcome to the program. Wa alaikum Go ahead. Um, I have one question. Mm -hmm. So um, I have a homework in school that told me to like draw a, like a microbiology. So I have to draw like the bacteria and some of them are alive and they are moving. Mm. So is it not allowed for me to draw it? That is perfectly fine. And I have done that a lot. And I've done it in the classes of pathology, in the classes of, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, some, there's something called uh, pharmacognosy where you study the plants and you draw what you see under the uh, microscope. So it is perfectly okay to do that. Uh, Sister Latifa from the USA for the purpose of learning. Abdul Rahman from Palestine. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, Sheikh. Yeah, Abdul Rahman, I was hoping it will be you. 
Masha Allah la quwwata illa billah. You're gone for a long time. How are you and how's your family? Alhamdulillah, we're great. Did you hear about our competition during Ramadan? Beautiful voices of reciting Quran. Yes, I did. Did you send a video already? Uh, no, inshallah, I will send it. Today should be the last. I want you to send it as soon as feasible, and your uh, younger brother as well. Okay. We okay. will have we will uh, have very good prizes. And I will do it. Inshallah. Go ahead. Abdurrahman, do you have any questions? Uh, uh, I want to tell you Ramadan Mubarak for you and for all the Muslims oh, in the world. Thank you so much. That's very sweet of you. You know, Abdurrahman, Ramadan Mubarak, of course, to you and your blessed family and all uh, Muslims, particularly Muslims in uh, Palestine. I saw a beautiful video yesterday where Palestinians were uh, actually washing off Al Masjid Al Aqsa and the uh, front yard and the backyard, the courtyard. May Allah bless you. I remembered you and I assumed that you were one of those who were doing the voluntary cleaning. May Allah bless you and your family, uh, Abdul Rahman. Mulki from the UK, Assalamu Alaikum. Alaikum Sheikh. Alaikum Salam wa Rahmatullah Mulki. Welcome to the program. Jazana wa Iyakum. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you, um, I have missed my uh, 23 days of last Ramadan because um, I was heavily pregnant. Mm. Do I have to pay money as well as making up the fast? I um, have a question for I... you, Mulki. Um, did you delay making up without a valid reason or you were still not feeling well? Um, after I um, gave birth, I was breastfeeding, so I was finding a bit difficult, so I'm still breastfeeding, but my baby was young hmm. at, uh, during the year, so I couldn't make up. So actually, that's a valid reason, uh, Mulki, no problem. Inshallah, I hope you'll be able to fast during this Ramadan. Then afterward, you can make up the missed days of the previous Ramadan without having to pay any extra ransom. Okay? Okay. Okay, well, I want to ask you another question. Sure. Um, I have uh, borrowed money from my sister uh, a long time ago. Um, she actually gave me money to hold in my bank um, and afterwards I decided to use the money. Um, I've used and then, then informed her that um, I've used the money to buy a land. Mm. And then she said, okay, it's fine. I asked to forgive, uh, you know, to forgive me for not telling her before using it. And she was okay. But after a few years, she kind of changed her mind saying that, because I lend you the money for the land. Now that you made more money, I I want I wanted the land that you bought with my money, not mm. the money that I actually borrowed from you. So is is it compulsory for me to give her the land or the money? Okay, the uh, sister uh, Milky, Mulki. Um, in the first place, you all know. And I'm sure you agree with me that you shouldn't have used the amana which was given to you to keep it, not to use it. But since you've used the money, if she asks for the amount, the same amount, you should pay it off immediately. If you are not able to pay it off and she asks for the value, you should give her the value. But if you have the cash and she said, I want it now, give her the same amount and you don't have to give her the land. And everyone, if you're given an amana to keep, you're not allowed to use it. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum. Sharif from the UK. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, firstly, I want to say uh, thank you for doing this amazing job. Um, I've been watching for a long time. You're doing a great job. Thank you, Sharif. Jazakallahu khairan. May Allah bless you and your family. I've got one question. Yeah. So I'm raised in the UK, and when I grow older, I'm thinking of migrating to a Muslim country like uh, Malaysia, 
Mm-hmm. Because having been brought up here, I see that it's not the best environment uh, to raise children. Mm-hmm. So two questions. A, what is your opinion on migration? And B, uh, to, watch, to which country should I migrate to if I've got the ability to? Okay. Sharif, Jazakallah Khairan. I'm a very big fan of migration. And migration is one of the core belief in Islam. So if a person is living in a society where, as you said that, it's not very convenient to raise your kids, then you should look for a better place to migrate to. No offense, I'm not talking about any particular country now. I'm not talking about the UK, I'm not talking about uh, the USA. There are some people who find it much better to raise their kids in a place like Birmingham or Leicester or Cardiff. They have an Islamic school, they have a musalla or a masjid and they are doing fine. We have a young girl whose name is Mariam. She calls us from the UK. MashaAllah, she's an amazing girl. Her family did an excellent job of raising her. So I'm not generalizing. But I say there are some people who happen to live in Egypt or Syria or wherever and they, they, they don't find it convenient for themselves because of political reasons perhaps. So migrate where you can practice your deen, preserve your identity and take care of your kids and teach them the deen. If you have the means and pay a visit to Malaysia, Malaysia is a beautiful country. If you want to be a very good Muslim in Malaysia, you can. If you want to be a loser in Malaysia, yes, you can as well. Likewise in Europe, likewise in the UK. But it's a lot easier to be a good Muslim in a place like Malaysia or the Muslim countries, obviously. So uh, the situation is kind of volatile, Sharif. A few years ago, people used to come from North America, from all over Europe to study in Syria, to study in Egypt, to study in Jordan, to study in Medina, you know, tens of thousands of them, even from Pakistan to study in in some of these Arabic countries, not only from Europe and the US. Situation has changed. So when you ask me, I wanna go study here and there, I said, no, 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 it's not safe. Don't travel to any of these countries, list of countries, okay? So yeah, I wanna save myself, I wanna learn the deen, but meanwhile it is not safe to live or upbring your children in some of these countries because the situation has changed. So when you ask me for an advice, the, for the time being, Malaysia is a beautiful place, yes, okay? Travel to Malaysia, pay it a visit you and your family, and check it out before you make up uh, your mind. Jazakallah khairan Sharif. Before I wrap it up, we had uh, uh, Suleiman from Spain who asked about the ice cream which has uh, 0.001% of alcohol. Let me explain two things. The first is, what is the hukm on adding alcohol to any food or drink? This act is haram irrespective of the amount or the percentage. The second question, what if I buy a medication or a food and they say there is a very, very insignificant amount and it evaporated? I would answer this question in the light of the availability. Yes, there is another ice cream which is alcohol free. This is what I should buy, this is what I should consume. But if there is nothing but this or all what is available in the market, the cake or whatever, there is the 0.0001% of alcohol and we don't have otherwise, then it's permissible to use this. Uh, Sister Amatullah from India, repenting from backbiting. We've discussed before, backbiting is forbidden whether you backbite a Muslim or a non-Muslim, okay? a politician or a shoemaker and it is best to preserve your tongue and zip of your mouth not to give your good deeds and hasanat as a gift to the person whom you hate most and that's why you backbited him but you give them your good deeds. So Tauba by season by not making any more backbiting and obviously practically speaking it's not a good idea to go to any person and say well I talked ill about you so forgive me because the human nature would not accept that rather make tawbah if the person is Muslim seek forgiveness for them 
uh, if they happen to be backbited in your presence, defend them in order to make up for your earlier uh, backbiting. Also, Al-Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the hadith, أَتْبِعِ السَّيِّئَةَ الْحَسَنَةَ تَمْحُهَا Follow the evil deed with one which is good, it shall erase it. So I'm going to give in a charity with the intention of wiping off this particular sin. I'm going to pray two rak'ahs after I make a special wudu for it with full concentration in the prayer in order for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me that particular sin. And insha'Allah, that will do it. As I said, brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah, this is... Or that was the last episode of Gardens of the Pious before Ramadan. In approximately an hour or so, it would be announced the moon citation of the blessed month of Ramadan. Allahumma ballighna Ramadan ghayra faqidina wa la mafqudin. Allahumma wafiqna fihi lis salati wa siyami wal qiyami wa qiraati al Quran. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfiru Allah li wa lakum. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا beginning from tomorrow إن شاء الله and every day during Ramadan with the exception of Friday we will have ask Huda same time happy Ramadan والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته to him he wanted humans to be the best and give his best religion to them allah our god is the greatest the one and only glory to him he wanted humans to be the best and give his best religion to them so why did they ignore that forgetting all about him in paradise worshiping cows fire and stones Selling the best with the cheapest price So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell and paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling their best with the cheapest price